Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, How's Clonty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me this time. I talk about tropical houseplants. And slightly different venue for the people that are usually here on my channel. We're going to be talking about the plant right behind me as part of the plant review series. This is one that was highly requested, and we're going to be talking about the philodendron micans. I will be adding in some shots throughout the video as well, just purely because it's currently growing on a wall, but I'll come back to that in a minute. First, for those people that have been here before, welcome back. As usual, I will add chapters down below, so if you want to skip to a specific chapter, you can. For the new people here, some kind of ground rules, essentially. This is a review series that I do, and I'll link it up here as well so you can see the rest of the reviews. But essentially, it's a place where I want to talk about some of the plants that I've had for a few years, give everybody else online an opportunity to share their experiences, and hopefully it will work as a bit of a repository in terms of how people have found having those plants, the care that they give for them, any challenges that have come up. So yeah, if you've got this exact plant, then obviously do comment down below. Me and everybody else would love to hear your experiences as well. But the little caveat here is, this specific video is my personal experiences, so it's gonna be biased to me, my growing conditions, and my location. So now that that's out of the way, let's dive into the first topic. So background with this plant, and as I mentioned, it is growing up a wall. I'll see if I can bring it one of the vines, but it's growing up the walls and it's now coming down the walls as well. <laughs> but um, this is a plant that I know um, was relatively difficult to find a few years back in loads of places all over the world. I think some places now you can find it a bit easier, but we'll talk about availability in a moment. But yeah, I think literally, I'll put it on the video title, but I think I've had this plant for either three or four years. This is one of the more uncommon plants that I got first when I was first starting to get heavily into my plant collecting. So it's been here for a while in one form or another. I can't tell you for sure if that is 100% the initial plant that I bought because that plant that I initially bought has since been propagated and grown, propagated and grown, propagates taken from the propagates. <laughs> ad infinitum essentially, and it has also been gifted to a whole host of people. Now, for the people that might not be aware, the philodendron micans, I know some people might pronounce it micans as well, I'm not entirely sure what the correct pronunciation is, hopefully the fan behind me that is reflecting, which is the ceiling fan, isn't disturbing too many people, if it is, I do apologise, but I thought best location to actually show you the plant, but, um, but yeah, this is essentially almost the velvet version of the philodendron heteracium, or the heart leaf philodendron. Granted, it's a bit of a misnomer, especially when you look at that plant specifically in its common name, because guess what? A lot of philodendrons have got heart-shaped leaves. This has got kind of partially heart-shaped leaves as well. But yeah, the background is after I had this plant for a long period of time, I've grown it in different conditions, I've grown it trailing down, I've grown it growing up a moss pole, I've grown it growing up a support stick, I've got it growing up a wall, and I'll touch on that in a bit. But yeah, overall, relatively amenable plant, I will say. Obviously you might be able to see, hopefully that might come up, in the video, but there is a bit of sun bleaching purely because where it is, <laughs> there's shade cloth in for the summer. I've got struggles with too much light in the summer and you might be able to see some of the shade cloth above me around that fan. That is all shade cloth essentially. But, and again, I'll link a video here in terms of my conservatory setup because I know that that's something that people have been asking for. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about the background on this plant. Let's move on to the next topic. So the speed of growth for this one is an interesting one, I will say. Now, in my experience, this isn't a particularly fast growing philodendron. And I know some people probably won't agree with me here, but again, I'm talking about my experience. If you've got 
different experiences, please do drop it down below and maybe give an indication of what your conditions are because I know people would like to know. The, the speed of growth for this not being the fastest thing in the world for me, it didn't bother me too much and it still doesn't bother me too much. And the little bit of a tidbit here, which I think might surprise a few people, because I know some people do struggle to grow this at all without any real issues. I know some people get on with it really well. I'm fortunate to be one of the people that gets on with this really well and it has never really caused me any real issues. But generally with velvet leaf philodendrons and most velvety leaved houseplants, they can be a bit of a challenge to grow. The interesting thing is, as I said, this is kind of the velvet form almost of the Heteraceum. I know it's probably a separate species, but to me, they're very, very similar, basically. There are some differences in terms of the color, the backs of the leaves and all these things, but the way that it grows, the morphology of the plant, with the exception of some coloration differences and the velvetiness, they're very, very similar, really. The Philodendron Heteraceum, which is, for a lot of people, an exceptionally easy plant to grow, has not been that for me at all. I have found it exceptionally slow growing. Uh, I've not had an awful lot of problems with that, but this for me is faster than that. But again, these have been my experiences in my condition. I am pretty sure people are gonna disagree with this, but as I said, share what you're doing below, because if anybody else is struggling like me, or having this kind of weird inconsistency between these two plants, I'm sure they'd wanna know. I, I kinda wanna know. But yeah, essentially, not the fastest growing philodendron that I own, not the slowest growing philodendron that I own. It's kind of in that midpoint region, really. But nevertheless, it, its speed of growth isn't something that has worried me. I will say, however, and I know this is probably going to be a question that might come up, when you've only got like a single node cutting or only got a couple of leaves, I found when it was very, very juvenile, especially when I'm propagating them, it does take a while for them to get going. When you get a plant with quite a bit of foliage in it, and again, similar with anything else as trailing, if you kind of chop and propagate and you can make a fuller plant, it will start looking bigger and bushier by default. Moving on to ease of propagation with this one. And it's, it's a very simple plant to propagate, really. You can take cutting from the nodes and, Usually it's quite good at giving some aerial roots as well, so it's really easy to see where the node is. And in terms of kind of methods of propagation that I've used, pretty much everything I think with this one. I've tried water, I've tried sphagnum moss, I have tried directly into pond, I have tried perlite. Did I say water? Water? I don't think I've actually tried it directly into soil yet, but I think with the exception of the Monstera siltipicana, which I did a review on recently, I put it at the top there as well. That's one of the first few that I tried directly into soil and I had good success with that one. And I wouldn't say it was any faster growing it directly in soil, but there was no acclimation period needed to move from one substrate to another, which for a lot of people might be that they're propagating to then go into soil. So it didn't have to take a hit back on that one, but I don't think it was any faster basically. But yeah, with this one, in terms of its propagation, as I said, most methods would have worked fine. Uh, I'll pick up a propagate and I can show you. So this is one of the propagates and I will move it up and down so you can see the length of it as well. There are multiple stems in here as well. I'll bring it in a bit closer so you might be able to see some of it as well. You can see some of the small, the leaves I find with this one come in really small, but they can then kind of inflate into a much larger size. They are very, very pretty. This one, just to give you an idea of how I was treating this one and how well it has done since then, it was in pond right by the window that you're seeing on the side of me there. And I just kept filling out its water reservoir, the, the water reservoir at the bottom of the pond. And really just kind of let it do its own thing. I'm pretty sure it had pests on it at some point. It was right up against the window in the winter as well. So it probably got a bit cold. In the summer, it was probably getting quite sun bleached. I'm trying to see if there's any leaves that have still got some sun bleaching on this one. No. And that's the interesting thing with these plants is that a lot of people will be like bright and direct. Don't give them bright, bright light. 
in my experience, and obviously don't put your plant permanently in bright lights, but this one can take it, which considering that this is getting beat down by light all day long and the shade cloth isn't doing as well as it is, the only real part of this plant that is getting kind of sun bleached really is this one leaf. So that tells you something basically there. But yeah, I kind of got this and I kind of let it do its own thing and it very, very happy. It has since been moved from there because I needed to use that space for other plants. <laughs> um, and this has now moved into the house by the front door. So it does get a bit of a gust of air, whether hot in the summer or cold in the winter, but it seems to be doing fine. It's slowed down its growth slightly, but uh, it's kind of to be expected. I've changed its location. It's probably getting less light than it would be getting in the conservatory itself but it seems to be doing all right. Onto availability. Now the availability with this plant, I kind of hinted at it at the very beginning of the video. It's an interesting one because I wouldn't class this, at least where I live, as an uncommon or even rare plant. I wouldn't class it as a common house plant at this point. So you, you generally wouldn't walk into most plant stores and garden centers and definitely find this available like you might do with the quintessential pothos essentially. But yeah, it's I know there's certain parts of the world that this is still a relatively tricky one to come by. I don't think even in those parts of the world that this is particularly expensive at this point in time. Looking back on when I first got this, and I, I think it's before a, a bigger hype was kind of generated around this plant back then anyway, because it was a good few years ago now. Um, I don't think it was more than kind of mid to low double digits really. And it was a relatively full plant. It wasn't like a single node cutting or anything like that. At least here in the UK where I live, and I would imagine it's probably true in Europe as well, you can usually find cuttings of this plant on places like eBay and things like that. And I don't think they're particularly expensive. I don't even think they're in that, that they're always necessarily in double digits for a single node cutting, whether rooted or unrooted. I don't think they're that expensive. But again, I do know that some people might struggle to find this in certain places. I would say reach out kind of to, and I really am not a fan of kind of houseplanty Facebook groups for several reasons, but um, asking somebody there or somebody who's already got one Generally, they they can be relatively vigorous growers. So most people would be quite happy to either send you a cutting or sell you a cutting. It's fine that this plant doesn't really take too much of a beat when it's relatively established. Again, I keep saying this in this video, but this has been in my experience, purely because I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the Mykins, where some people find it really easy and some people really don't. Hopefully this might give you a bit of insight as to why I find it relatively easy and maybe what you can kind of do to kind of rectify that really. This is definitely not a philodendron that likes a lot of hovering basically. It's, as I said, I kind of left it there, did very little to it. It was getting some decent light though and it was getting the moisture coming in from the tray underneath the pond. But other than that, it kind of is okay doing its own thing. pests on this one. Now, out of a lot of philodendron that I have, at least in my experience, this one has, I think, pretty much had everything. So it's gone through spider mites at some point. Granted, that didn't grow too, too fast. It has had mealybugs at some point. Again, it didn't take over it very quickly. And people that have been around know that I've been dealing with mealybugs for a while here. It's also dealt with whitefly because I've got some whitefly issues at the moment in here didn't cause it too much of an issue. Most of the leaves on this plant that's on the wall behind me have actually got the dead carcasses of the white flies. Still seems to be doing fine. It doesn't seem to kind of bother it too, too much. And more importantly, this is one that can be attractive to thrips. So one to bear in mind that this is one that can be quite attractive to thrips. 
I'm trying to think if I've ever, I think I might have lost a, a relatively established plant that started off as a cutting that rooted out and all these things to thrip damage. Very rarely have I ever thrown away entire plants because of the level of thrip damage. This was one of them. I will follow that comment up really quickly by saying that was the only time that I've had a severe thrips infestation on any of my micans. So, but yeah, this could be one that is a bit more attractive. And generally speaking, in my experience with a lot of my velvety leaved philodendrons or houseplants in general, they are not that attractive to thrips. So this is quite an interesting one. And I will say the thrip damage that I found on this plant is on the underside of the leaf, which at least in my experience, when I feel it, it's less velvety than the top side of the leaf. So mm, that might have something to do with it. And the thrips generally are found behind the leaf. Uh, I'm gonna start rambling here as well. I generally say, well, a lot of the times thrips are found on the underside of the leaves. But saying that, I also find thrips on the top side of the leaves. This is one that didn't have that. So definitely worth checking if you're ever worried with your micans. Definitely flip the leaf around and see if you can see some thrips there as well. Moving on to accessories, and I do have a lot to say for accessories for this specific plant. The one thing I will say, and I'm looking down at its pot, because if the plant, the plant has obviously hit the ceiling of the conservatory and it's now coming back down again, but there's a few things that you could do with this plant. And obviously it's the same with a lot of these trailers, the, the, the philodendron heteraceum or the heart leaf philodendron, a lot of the pothos family as well, a lot of the epipremnum family, they can be trailers, it's fine. That The leaf does get smaller. The one thing I will say is some of the leaves on the wall, and I would imagine it's the same if you put it on a board, of this Mykins is almost the size of my palm, and my palm isn't particularly small. But some of the more traditional size leaves, you might be able to see here that there's a big difference there in size because that doesn't take anywhere near my entire palm. But if I show you one of the biggest leaves here, and I don't know whether or not it's going to pick up in the camera, if not, I'll insert some footage here. But it does take over almost my entire palm. So that's something of note. It can get bigger, as with a lot of these trailing plants, if you give it something to climb on. Now, having said that, you can use support sticks. I've used support sticks, that was fine. You can use moss poles, that's absolutely fine as well. You can let it trail, that's absolutely fine. And you can give it a board. The thing I will say, what I was just saying now, is with a board or with a wall in my case, I saw the biggest leaves. It did take a while, and it did take a while for it to attach. The people that have seen this wall before, and you might be able to see potentially there in the background, you might be able to see there's a black behind the plants, is because what I've done with this wall, because I don't want the aerial roots to attach directly onto the wall, onto the brickwork, and maybe ruin some of the, the brickwork that's there, I've just put um, a waterproof membrane that you would usually use to line ponds in the garden. Yes, when I put it up, it didn't look like the best thing in the world, so bear that in mind if you do want to try this method. But very quickly, if you've got like a shingler, like the fillet, the Monstera Dubai that I've got here, which again is getting bleached to no end, but it's not dying, it's happy, it's still growing, it's fine. And the micans, it quickly fills out. Like I know you can see a bit of the blackness there, but it's gonna fill that space up as well. Yes, it will take some time, but that was a really, really cool thing because actually when this plant does attach, all the leaves move downwards, it doesn't need anything attaching it to the wall. Eventually the, the aerial roots itself will attach. And they, as I said, they do attach to this waterproof membrane and it's good. It doesn't cause any royal issue to your walls either. Now, in terms of kind of what I, the growing media that I've kind of grown this in, you saw the propagate in the video that was in pond in a water reservoir. I've had it in pond without a water reservoir and just flushed the pond through as I would normally water a soil media, that was fine. I've got it in my usual airy aroid soil mix, that's doing fine. I've got it, this one specifically that I've got behind me is in a terracotta pot. 
doing great. I've grown it in a net pot, doing great. Grown it in a plastic pot, doing great. The accessories with this one can be abundant, but it's up to you as to what you want to do it with, basically. I don't think, with the exception of the plank, I don't think most of these things made much of a difference. Obviously, if you're letting it trail, you won't get the biggest leaves. You probably get some slightly smaller leaves, but the support sticks alone were giving me slightly larger leaves than if it was trailing, not as large as if it was on a wall, but an in-between level there, basically. Definitely, with this one, checking for pests on a regular basis. I don't think it's a particularly hungry plant. It does get fertilized relatively frequently in the summer, a bit less so in the winter, but it doesn't pick up because of it in the summer, if that makes sense. But yeah, relatively easygoing plant, at least in my experience. Wrapping up with some final thoughts for this one. As with all of my review series, I will start off with the usual question that I will give myself, essentially, is if I didn't have this plant and I had the chance to buy it and I knew what I know now after growing it for so many years, would I buy it? Yes. Without a shadow of a doubt, basically. Would I personally buy it when I've got as many plants as I do at the moment in my collection? Probably still yes, actually, because thinking about it, I like it as a filler plant to climb up the wall, and this will climb up a wall a lot faster than a shingler or a Dubai or anything like that. It's a good plant in that respect. If I wasn't growing it up that way, it can be a bit leggy, and it can be a bit of an awkward shape, and you could see on the propagate that I showed you, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. Granted, I haven't taken an awful lot of time to make it look pretty. I have seen some pictures online of people growing micans, and it looks like the most beautiful either cascading plant or plant that grows up. To me, it's, it's not that important plant to me, and this moved me quite nicely onto the scoring of this plant from zero being the worst and 10 being the best. Where would I rank this? For me, a six or a seven maybe, and I'd probably lean more towards a six. Not because there's any issue with the plant, the speed of its growth isn't a problem, it can propagate quite easily. On a purely personal level, this plant doesn't really excite me. And I will say this plant didn't excite me when I bought it, but it was something that I wanted to challenge myself with. I think it was the first velvet leaf house plant that I had that could potentially present some problems. So I got it as a bit more of a challenge. It does also tell you something though, even though I'm not hugely or haven't ever been enamored with this plant, that it's still part of my collection however many years later. So maybe that gives you a bit of insight as well. And it, as I said, it's not because I dislike this plant. I've just got others that I prefer more of. But that's just me. Don't come for me, please. <laughs> But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about this. And as always, I encourage you to leave your own reviews. I'm sure a lot of you might already have this plant or people that might be struggling as well. See if you can have conversations in the comments. It, the community in the comments is getting amazing now and it just gives me so much joy to see you all like talk to each other as well. Um, for a lot of people that aren't aware and might wonder why they've made a comment and I haven't responded, it's really difficult to keep on top of responding to everybody all the time when I've got as many videos as I have and I've obviously got a full-time job and I'm doing filming like this as well. So generally what I will say with most of my videos is I will keep track of the comments and kind of have conversations and respond to you in the first three to five days, maybe even a week basically, but after that it's really difficult to go back on every single one of the videos and look at the comments. I do occasionally, but if you do want to reach me more immediately, uh, do follow me on Instagram as well. The link is down below in the description and you can usually get a response from me a bit quicker on there basically. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you all here soon and I truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.